Shalom from Israel to all of the Daystar viewers around the world. I'm Moshe Bartzvi, the producer and founder of Israel Now News. We at Israel Now News are dedicated to bringing you the full story and the truth about Israel from Israel. It's written in the Holy Bible when David said in Psalm 25:5, Lead me in your truth and teach me, for you are the God of my salvation. For you I wait all the day long. And God says in Zechariah 8.16, These are the things that you shall do. Speak out the truth to one another. Judge with truth and judgment to peace in your gates. And always search for the truth, and the truth shall set you free. John 8.31 I hope you enjoyed the program. God bless you from Jerusalem. Shalom, shalom. Welcome to Israel Now News. I'm Yochanan El Rome. And I'm Erin Viner. In our top story, the government of King Abdullah of Jordan wants to free the Naharayim killer. 110 out of 120 members of the Jordanian parliament have signed a petition calling for the release of Ahmad Musa Mustafa de Kamish. He is the Jordanian soldier who murdered seven Israeli children in cold blood. In 1997, a class of 80 7th and 8th grade Jewish schoolgirls were on a field trip near the Israeli-Jordanian border when Dekamish, a corporal in the Jordanian army, opened fire on them. A Jordanian court under the leadership of then King Hussein sentenced the soldier to life in prison. But after serving only 16 years, members of parliament are demanding his release. Dekamish remains unrepentant for his actions. In an interview with the Jordanian newspaper, he said, if I could return to that moment, I would behave exactly the same way. He added that every day that passes, I grow stronger in the belief that what I did was my duty. The population of Jordan is more than 80 percent Palestinian, leading many to consider it as a Palestinian state and therefore a solution to the Middle East conflict. The Hashemite kingdom is in the midst of a political shift with greater power being transferred from the ruling monarchy to the electorate, which is overwhelmingly Islamist. The move to release Takamesh is an example of the elected parliament rebelling against King Abdullah. Several of the politicians have even referred to the former soldier as a hero for having murdered the Jewish schoolgirls. Although Jordan's ambassador to Israel has assured the bereaved families that Takamesh will not be pardoned, the ultimate decision lies with the king. Bahrain has become the first Arab country to blacklist Hezbollah as a terrorist organization. The radical Shiite group, which controls Lebanese politics, has masterminded several devastating terrorist attacks around the world. The European Union has yet to declare Hezbollah a terrorist organization, despite the overwhelming evidence that they are undoubtedly behind some of the most vicious terrorist attacks in recent times. Military officials in Iran are claiming to have successfully tested three new land-to-land -land missiles. The Islamic Republic's ground force commander, General Ahmed Reza, announced that when the enemy observes his nation's armed forces continually maintaining a presence in war game zones with their fingers on the trigger, no one will dare to invade Iran's borders. Forces loyal to Syrian President Bashar al-Assad are guilty of using chemical weapons against the Syrian people. According to a report in the Times of London, soil samples smuggled out of the war-torn country have tested positive for chemical weapons. British defense officials who examined the samples said that some kind of chemical weapon was used in Syria. Both Assad and the rebel forces have been warned by the international community against using weapons of mass destruction. Last month, U.S. President Barack Obama said, I want to make it absolutely clear to Assad and those under his command, the world is watching. The use of chemical weapons is and would be totally unacceptable, and if you make the tragic mistake of using these weapons, there will be consequences and you will be held accountable. Meanwhile, the Syrian Human Rights Observatory claims that Syrian forces dropped two gas bombs on the city of Aleppo last week. Three people were killed and 16 injured. More than 70,000 people have been killed in the uprising in Syria, which has gone on for more than two years. According to newly released information, the Al-Qaeda terror organization was planning to attack the U.S. Embassy in Ankara. 
The New York Times is reporting that raids conducted in the Turkish cities of Istanbul and Korlu by security forces last February foiled a series of slated terror attacks. Turkish police announced the seizure of more than 50 pounds of plastic explosives and detonators and also acquired valuable intelligence information that led to the discovery of two terrorist cells conspiring to attack not only the U.S. Embassy in the Turkish capital, but also a museum and a Jewish synagogue in Istanbul. Human Rights Watch has condemned Hamas for its refusal to investigate the public executions of suspected Israeli collaborators. Nearly four months ago, citizens of Gaza, whom Hamas suspected of collaborating with Israel, were rounded up and imprisoned. They were later handed over to Hamas gunmen who publicly executed them. Some of the men were shot in the street and then dragged behind motorcycles while crowds spat on the bodies and threw stones. The New York-based human rights organization said that Hamas leader Ismail Haniyeh promised an inquiry into the executions, but since then the terror group has not only failed to investigate, it has issued additional warnings to Israeli sympathizers that they will meet the same fate. A spokesman for Hamas said that they will soon begin another round of large-scale arrest of collaborators. Hamas officially executed six men for collaborating with Israel, but 32 others suspected of treason were brutally murdered after they were handed over to Hamas extremists. Threats by the Palestinian Authority to sue Israeli soldiers at The Hague may backfire, as acceptance of a lawsuit at the International Criminal Court would also enable the filing of anti-Palestinian litigation. The Israeli Shurat Hadin Civil Rights Organization is already preparing to sue the Palestinian Authority for alleged responsibility for thousands of cases of terrorism. The NGO has launched a campaign called Terrorizing Terror to collect testimony from Israeli victims via Facebook Internet accounts and use such evidence as a means to file lawsuits against the PA. Shurat Adin has already won similar cases amounting to over $1 billion in damages and successfully collected more than $120 million on behalf of victims of terror attacks in Israel. The Israeli Defense Ministry has released its official statistics on fallen soldiers and victims of terrorist attacks. This year, 93 soldiers were killed. That brings the total to 23,578 soldiers who have fallen in Israel's wars. This year, 10 people were killed in terrorist attacks, bringing the total to 2,493 killed by terrorism in Israel. In his remarks at the opening ceremonies for fallen IDF soldiers, Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu said, We have been forced as a nation to fight for our right to exist. Since we became a state, we've had to fight for our freedom. Haters persecuted us in each generation, harmed us, and sought to erase Israel off the face of the earth. We learned that only a strong defense force can ensure that we will not be harmed. The Prime Minister went on to say that we are here thanks to those who fell on behalf of Israel. Israel's Memorial Day is followed by celebration of Israel's independence. One of the proud traditions of Yom Ha'atzma'ut is the National Bible Quiz. Teenagers from all over the country are invited to participate in the competition, which tests their knowledge of biblical trivia. Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu met with the contestants one week before the competition when he said that the Bible is the foundation of our existence, our bond with the land of Israel, despite those who try to oppose this. Israel's population has reached 8 million. A report released by Israel's Central Bureau of Statistics reveals that Israel has grown by 137,000 people since last Independence Day. The report states that 70 percent of the Jewish population of Israel are native-born Israelis and that more than half of them are second-generation Israeli citizens. There are now more than six million Jews living in Israel, making it the largest Jewish community in the world. As Israel celebrated Independence Day last week, the Jewish state received a very special gift on the occasion of its 65th birthday. The original 1917 Balfour Declaration will be placed on display for the public for the first time. The document is a statement from Lord Arthur James Balfour announcing support from Great Britain for the establishment of a national home for the Jewish people in the historical land of Israel. Until now, the document has never left British soil, 
but will be on exhibit for a brief time at the Independent House in Tel Aviv. Last week, terrorists attacked the city of Boston. Two blasts were detonated at the end of the Boston Marathon, leaving several people dead and more than 100 injured. We at Israel Now News express our deepest sympathy to the victims of this senseless tragedy and pray for the swift and total recovery of those injured. That concludes the news portion of our show. Stay tuned for Ask the Source with Josh Reinstein. Hello and welcome to Ask the Source. I'm your host, Josh Reinstein, and we're here on a beautiful day on our rooftop studio in Jerusalem. My guest today is Deputy Mayor of Jerusalem, Naomi Tsur. Deputy Mayor, thank you for being on the show. Thank you for inviting me. You're doing this groundbreaking conference this week about green pilgrimage. Can you tell our viewers a little bit about it? This is a, a very exciting initiative. Uh, we are this evening opening uh, the first International Jerusalem Symposium on Green and Accessible Pilgrimage. We are inviting pilgrim cities from around the world, faith communities from around the world, to share the concept of what pilgrimage means both to the pilgrim, the faith community as a whole, and to the pilgrim cities that are their spiritual destination. Of course, you have to understand that for Jerusalem, this is a special challenge and a special opportunity because we are a faith destination for three world religions. Billions of people look to Jerusalem as their spiritual goal. And one of the things we're trying to achieve here is to get all the faith communities on board with the concept of making our community's lives more sustainable and linking the faith journey with the physical journey we have to take to become responsible citizens of the world. This is, this is a global issue now and cities are going to be playing the major role in making the world uh, a place that can enable people to be healthy, happy um, and to enable life on the planet as we know it. Uh, and, and to help us to protect the uh, creation that the good Lord uh, gave us. This is one of the uh, roles of man, and man today is living in cities. I don't know whether our audience knows that at the beginning of the 20th century, just 15% of the world were living in cities, but as we sit now, it's already 65, 70%, and by the end of the 21st century, 90% of the world's population will be living in cities. This means that the role of cities is enormous, and when I make some kind of a, an equation of cities plus faiths, I get the answer of pilgrimage, because about a quarter of a billion people around the world annually are going on pilgrimages from one city to another. And our goal with this network, and Jerusalem is showcasing the work that we're doing in our city, other cities in Israel, many cities from around the world, is how to create a joint initiative of faiths and cities to make pilgrimage a worthwhile experience not only as a spiritual experience but to make us understand our role in preserving that creation that the good lord has given us well our viewership is mostly bible believing christians from all over the world why would christians want to come to this conference i think for christians this conference is 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 interesting as it is for any world faith um, and we're trying to talk about a world platform where the faiths are not exclusive of each other as they might have been hundreds of years ago. We're trying to talk about a world where faiths live side by side. They may not agree with each other, but we take as our uh, mentor King Solomon. King Solomon in Kings uh, 1, chapter 8, uh, said something incredible that many people perhaps overlook these days, but I would remind our viewers. He was blessing the children of Israel at the time of the dedication of the temple that he had been allowed to build when his father, King David, had not been allowed to build the first temple. And he was full of thanks uh, to God for allowing him to build the temple, blessing the children of Israel that they had been given this wonderful temple to worship in. But then he turns to God and he says to God the following incredible sentence. He says, let the stranger who comes to pray in your house, be welcome, 
and listen to his prayer and answer it, that he may know your name. Now, I may not be quoting exactly, but please go to Kings 1, chapter 8, because this is the most incredible message of world tolerance. It's saying this is a place where the children of Israel are going to pray, but we welcome strangers. Our house is a house of prayer for all the peoples of the world. And I think this is a message that we can bring to all the other religions that are participating and the cities that are participating because it's about sharing reverence. If I feel reverence when I go to pray at the Western Wall and a Christian feels reverence in a certain church and a Hindu feels reverence in a certain temple, what we have to learn is to appreciate the reverence of the other in their place of worship. And I would like the same respect to be shown for my places of worship. So this mutual reverence is a goal. Mutual understanding of a need for respect for God's creation. I would hope that that's a message that all our Christian friends around the world will welcome and want to be part of. Ms. Deputy Mayor, there are literally tens of millions of people watching this show. What message would you have for our viewing audience? Well, I would ask you all to adopt the slogan that we have adopted for Green Pilgrimage. And it's an interesting slogan. We are asking everyone to leave a positive footprint, which means that in our journeys, in our work, in our efforts as pilgrims over time, we try and make sure that not only do we not damage the fabric of society and the environment around us, that, but we try and make a very positive contribution to it. The world is full of talk about negative footprints and I think that the concept of a positive footprint is what can get everyone on board and everyone to join in this incredible venture. Thank you Deputy Mayor for being on the show and thank you for tuning in to Ask the Source. I'm your host Josh Reinstein, now back to the studio. Up next, Shining Light from Israel. Jerusalem, a historical journey through archaeology and art. Jerusalem, a mosaic of different peoples, faiths, and nationalities. Nevertheless, despite this diversity, under the sovereignty of Israel, Jerusalem is a city that works. But has it always been this way? The first historical mention of Jerusalem is in the Bible, in the era of the patriarchs. King David declares Jerusalem as Israel's capital, known from that point on also as Zion. His son, King Solomon, builds the first temple. But the temple is destroyed by the Babylonians and the Jews are exiled. King Cyrus's declaration enables the Jews to return and rebuild the temple. Alexander the Great's conquests include Jerusalem However, his successors desecrate the temple, which leads to the Maccabees' revolt against the Greeks' imposition of Hellenism. The Roman Empire seizes control, and King Herod renovates the temple. A large-scale revolt against a corrupt and vicious Roman reign fails. The second temple is destroyed, and the Jews are banned from Jerusalem. Sixty years pass, and Bar Kokhba leads another revolt for the freedom of Jerusalem. But it fails after three years of battle. Jews are banned from the city, renamed by the Romans Aelia Capitolina, in order to eradicate its Jewish heritage. Roman Emperor Constantine converts to Christianity and reinforces the ban on Jews entering Jerusalem. A new religion, Islam, sweeps through the Middle East. Non-Muslims are declared second-class citizens. Crusaders conquer Jerusalem in a bloodbath of Jews and Muslims. 
2,000 Jews are burned alive in the main synagogue and the city is depopulated of its previous inhabitants. The first organized mass Jewish return arrives from France and England. The Mamluks defeat the Christian kingdom of Jerusalem and building and renovating of synagogues and churches is banned. The great Mishnai commentator, Rabbi Ovadia of Bartanura, settles in Jerusalem. The Ottoman Empire takes over, imposing restrictions on Jews and Christians, and Sultan Suleiman rebuilds the walls. But as the empire declines, Jerusalem is badly neglected. Still, the Jewish people stream back, build new neighborhoods, and re-establish their majority by 1863. World War I breaks out. The Ottoman Empire collapses and makes room for a new Middle East. The British Foreign Secretary, Arthur James Balfour, declares the establishment of a national home for the Jewish people. Britain receives a mandate to create a Jewish homeland, but forbids Jews from blowing the shofar or reading holy scrolls at the Western Wall. Thousands of Muslims are incited to unleash an attack against Jews in Jerusalem and Hebron. 86 Jews are brutally murdered, hundreds are wounded. UN Resolution 181 declares Jerusalem as a corpus separatum, a separate entity. A Jewish state is declared as Jerusalem is put under siege, conquered and divided. 58 synagogues are destroyed or desecrated. Harsh limitations are imposed on Jews and Christians for 19 years. The Six-Day War. Jerusalem is reunited and freedom and equality are restored. Throughout history, only Israel has protected the freedom of all peoples and faiths in Jerusalem. Please stay tuned for the ICEJ report from the International Christian Embassy, Jerusalem. On Monday, April 8th, sirens sounded throughout Israel and life came to a complete stop for two minutes as Israelis around the country paused to remember the tragedy of the Holocaust. Israeli dignitaries and foreign leaders, including President Shimon Peres, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, and U.S. Secretary of State John Kerry, gathered in the Warsaw Ghetto Square Memorial at Yad Vashem to honor the six million slain victims of the Holocaust. During the ceremony, Dr. Jürgen Bühler and Reverend Juha Ketteler placed a commemorative wreath on behalf of the International Christian Embassy, Jerusalem. I have with me today Ms. Susanna Kokonen, the director of the Christian Desk at Yad Vashem. And it's a great joy and a great pleasure to have you with us. Welcome Thank on you. our show today. Thank you. Susanna, tell me, Yad Vashem made a strategic decision some years ago, which uh, Yad Vashem, our listeners need to know that it's the biggest institution here in the land to commemorate the Holocaust. And they made a decision just a few years ago to establish a Christian desk here at Yad Vashem. This is a historic step for Yad Vashem, isn't it? Well, yes, it is. Um, many Christians since the 1990s had been coming to Yad Vashem. We had movies like the Schindler's List coming out and people were really interested in having a program at Yad Vashem when visiting. And there wasn't anything specifically for them. And so in 2006, in cooperation with the ICEJ, Yad Vashem established the Christian Friends of Yad Vashem the Christian department here at Yad Vashem and now we have programs for Christians and we invite them to join us in all of the special events and commemorations as well as to learn more about the Holocaust. 
Well, to think that the institution which commemorates the biggest atrocity which we Christians did to the Jewish people, that they have a Christian desk, was it an easy decision for them to do that? Well, it was a very big decision, so big in fact that they needed the permission of the Israeli Prime Minister. At the time it was Ehud Olmert and he gladly gave it knowing the ICEJ and the ICEJ's work. Mm. And so Yad Vashem was able to start this activity. Initially nobody really knew what it was going to be, what precisely would this department be doing. But now it's becoming more and more a very established part of Yad Vashem's daily activity. But tell me, what exactly is the Christian desk doing here in Israel? Well, it's really exciting because actually this week we have our fourth annual Christian Leadership Seminar here at the Apache. Hmm. We have leaders and pastors from different nations. They come here for a week-long study. They meet with Holocaust survivors. They hear lectures and they also travel the land. Hmm. So when they go back to their homes, they are not only qualified to speak about Yad Vashem, they become like our ambassadors, most of them, but they have also seen the land and they wow. understand the reality of coming from the Holocaust to the state of Israel and what's the significance of that process. Hmm. So tell me, we have listeners today, they watch us in Dallas, Texas, in Singapore, mm -hmm. Hong Kong, all over the world. What can an, a Christian which is watching us today, what can they practically do to make sure that this testimony of the Holocaust stays alive and how can they help uh, Yad Vashem in a very practical way? If you are a tour leader or you are a tourist coming to Israel, come to Yad Vashem and contact us and come and visit Yad Vashem for a special visit to understand more about Christianity and the Holocaust. Please consider supporting the work of the Christian Desk at Yad Vashem. Become a friend of Yad Vashem with a donation of $25. Adopt a tree commemorating the righteous among the nations for a $100 donation. Or for a $1,000 donation, help us to record the testimonies of Holocaust survivors from around the world. We need your help to make sure that this dark story of the Holocaust, where the church failed so greatly in Europe 70 years ago, this story needs to be kept alive in order to keep future generations to avoid making the same mistake again. We need your support urgently here in Jerusalem to keep that work alive and to make sure that testimony of Yad Vashem will be also brought out for future generations. We are your embassy here in Jerusalem on Yom HaShoah. May the Lord bless you out of Zion. That's all for this edition of Israel Now News. I'm Yochanan El Rome. And I'm Erin Viner, reporting from our studio in Jerusalem. Please join us again next week for all your Israel updates.